Yeah. I, I, I spoiled myself in that I never really uh, experimented properly with drinking in college. So I just like jumped straight into whiskey right after college. So now I, I can't go back. So everyone <laughs> likes to talk about, everyone likes to talk about beer and wine on Twitter and everywhere. And I'm like, no, I, I hate beer and wine. <laughs> Not a fan. Usually it seems like beer and wine are kind of your, your gateway cocktails because they're very cheap. And so you experience them in college or something like that. And yeah. Then you realize like, I don't have to buy a case of 32 cans for $5. And you know, there, there's a quality difference when, when, I, yeah. when I choose my alcohol differently. So. I have to say that all, all of my hard liquor experiences in college were pretty negative. Um, yes. and, um, but, but in grad school, I started playing in an Irish rock band really just to make money. Um, I, you know, not a lot of money, but a little money. That's really, that's how I made ends meet in grad school was it's a cash only business. You go to the bar, they feed you, they pour you liquor. Um, and so I played in Irish rock bands all the way through grad school. And uh, that has permanently altered my drinking experience for the better. Nice. Yeah. I, I mean, like I every historian, a, right? We all, yeah, we all, I haven't <laughs> had that cool of a side job. The coolest side job I've had was a, uh, I worked on a political podcast for like a couple of months and it was, or a couple of years and it was awesome. I mean, it would be good if grad schools paid grad students enough that we didn't have to have side jobs, but mm -hmm. I really, I really needed just a few hundred dollars more a month and I could get it by going up on stage and drinking heavily and screaming uh, about the, you know, the British empire and how it needed to be destroyed into a microphone. And that was really cathartic and really, it was really excellent. I, I highly recommend that to everybody. David, I mean, having known you for a long time, I don't think you need a stage to yell about the British Empire. So. <laughs> that is a fact. That, that is, is a fact. fact. So. But it's um, better so with a microphone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is. I mean, it's just louder at the very That's least, right? Correct. So, yeah. All right. So um, you guys ready? I, mean, I think we should probably get going. Um, yeah. So thank you, everyone. I see um, our participants are, are still coming in. But uh, welcome to episode three, if you can believe it, of Drinking with Historians. Um, I'm Matt Gabriel. I'm a professor at Virginia <laughs> Tech. And um, my co-host is? Farsha. I'm a grad student at Berkeley. I study U.S. history, so I am a novice in all things medieval history. Yes, but she's but I am a drinking damn... Varsity. And she's a damn good historian. Yeah, <laughs> pun intended in that I studied. Yeah, I study dams and I study rivers so. and I study water. So I, uh, I, I have an open mind when it comes to things that are not in my specialty because my specialty is very niche. So. <laughs> Well, you're talking to two medievalists, so I mean, like, you're yeah. talking to me right here, so. <laughs> anyway, yeah. um, we're, we're, we're very honored to be, uh, you know, and, and pleased to be joined by uh, uh, David Perry, who's a, a medieval historian, and we'll be talking about uh, how much he loves, absolutely loves the Dark Ages. I love it. Um, but before we get to that, um, I will point out, there's already been a question of, uh, noted about the, the Q&A, is that David and I have known each other for a very long time. I think we should get that out in the open right there, and our, our friendship has endured despite the fact that as you can see from his hat, he's a Red Sox fan and I am a Yankees. <laughs> so I mean, that's 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 the trust that we we built in one another. So if we can move past this, you know, maybe there is hope for medievalists out there. Anyway. <laughs> um, anyway, so the first question we have to ask, of course, which we ask for all of our guests, like David, what are you drinking tonight? I am drinking Jameson Irish whiskey. I like to share that I buy it at Costco, just not sponsored. But this is a 1.75 <laughs> liter bottle, and in the middle of a pandemic, when you're not supposed to go out that often. It's good to buy in bulk. So um, I feel like I'm doing my part for public health by buying that, that's right, that extremely large bottle of whiskey. And we, as nice. you noticed, if you came earlier, I was talking about my Irish, my Irish pub experience, which is continuing. Um, there's been a lot of Irish music, a lot of Irish bands. I'm now back in the Twin Cities where I went to grad school and I'm in an Irish pub band. And so drinking whiskey, drinking Irish, Jameson in particular, it's just, it's just what I do, it's comfortable. It's a good Friday evening drink. It's nothing fancy. That's wonderful. Yeah. So I myself am drinking um, Woodford Reserve um, bourbon, and it's it's double oaked, which is just lovely and smooth. And I think, <laughs> Marcia, you you know, I were talking about like we might need to change whatever this thing is from drinking with historians to like whiskey with historians or something like yeah. that. Because if I'm correct, you're drinking whiskey as well. Again, yeah. right? I'm drinking Larceny. I barely drink anything besides whiskey, so it'll be, uh, it, it's tough to get me out of that shell. But I do think there are some people who are his friends who manage to drink things other than whiskey. I, it's just I haven't met many of them. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. 
I mean, uh, I, you know, I drink things other than whiskey. I believe that immediately after this podcast, I have a, te- I have a margarita date. So it's going to be a great Friday. That's going to be a so, great Friday. It's going to be a great Friday. Yeah, we're ecumenical I, I, here. We are. And I think, you know, like you were, you were saying earlier, David, I mean, like, you know, sometimes we can even drink non-alcoholic drinks as well, like tonic water with some, some syrup yep. or something like that. I mean, basically an Italian. Sour soda, cherry right, syrup so. comes from the, um, the Bosnian su- uh, supermarket in North Minneapolis or Northeast Minneapolis. Someone asked that on the Q&A um, where you find it. I don't know, but the Bosnians have sour cherry syrup. It's also really good for um, barbecue sauce. If you make your own barbecue sauce, um, and I can just say that during this time of being home all the day, I've been doing a lot of barbecue, a lot of cooking, a lot of smoking, a lot of slow cooking. Um, I sort of like not going to the office. I don't like the all-encompassing fear and anxiety about a global <laughs> pandemic, but the not going to the office and cooking a lot of slow food over the, over the hours and hours has been really good for everything but my waistline. Yeah. I... <laughs> I've actually been uh, shocked at the fact that I have been reading a lot more since the pandemic started. I mean, half of that was because I had comps before (laughs) May, but after comps since May 12th, I've actually read a lot. So I've like read a lot for my dissertation, which uh, is frustrating, but fun. But I've also read like three fiction books and it's like the most fiction I've read in. Yeah. A long time. Uh, But to get this back onto history, uh, you two are both medieval historians. I have never taken a medieval history class. I don't even know if the term medieval is still accepted. I think I I thought it was Middle Ages. Um, So the question I want to ask is, what is medieval history? When is it? (laughs) And um, why is it cool? (laughs) I'm not, I'm not sure that it's cool. Um, okay. I, I should say, I'm not, I'm not sure that anything about it is cool. So the Middle Ages, right, is something that is invented by people who want to say very clearly that they aren't in the Middle Ages anymore. The whole history of it as a concept is about negation, but by people in the Renaissance, by the way, I want to say there's no such thing as the Renaissance. Um, it's people, oh, it's people in, in this period, in the, in, the, in the 15th century, really, who want to say, look, there were the Romans in antiquity and they were good. And there's us now here and we are also good. And the stuff in between that is this middle period. So medieval, middle age, this, this middle period, which was not so good. Um, and that legacy is really stuck. Um, it's, it's amazing kind of how well that framing has stuck over the past 600 years, which is a really long time, right? Um, so there is this, I mean, those years happen. There is a period. There are things that are distinct about them. Um, when Rome stops to stops really asserting dominant bureaucratic control over Western Europe, um, when Christianity and, and particularly Catholic Christianity in Rome starts to extend at least cultural control over a broader region, um, there are definitely things that are we can talk about as medieval, and there are there are two or three hundred year periods where we can really identify strong consistencies in how politics and power are organized or how uh, the majority of people are thinking about religion or culture or economic ways of life period in history that you can take and say yup this is consistent and coherent that's just not how humans work did i blur out a little bit there no i think we got that um i I guess yeah so okay based on I that got, uh, i got the you're unstable but maybe it was just talking about <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe maybe my maybe my therapist was uh was hacking yeah. <laughs> yeah so based on that explanation of medieval history as like negation why you know what gets you excited about studying the past why did you choose the middle ages or the medieval history and you know what's your favorite course to teach uh when you sure. teach so I, I became a medievalist because, I'm, well, for two reasons. Um, I went to, to Wesleyan University in Connecticut, wonderful little small liberal arts university. And I took, um, I was really excited by modern 20th century labor history and by medieval history. And it turns out, and this is in some ways a little embarrassing, both of my parents are fairly well-known professors of, well, late now, late professors of US history. And I just didn't want my mom to bother me. While I, I mean, that's, that is really the reason I decided to focus a little more on medieval history rather than U.S. history. 
I didn't want my mom. That is also why I studied Spanish instead of French because my mom was fluent in French. Um, I can't tell you that these are strong, correct reasons, but they are true. Um, <laughs> what, what I loved about the Middle Ages, though, was that it felt very familiar in a way. It felt connected to histories that I knew, again, as a, as a teenager and as a, as a, as a college, undergraduate college student. And I spent a lot of time kind of trying to undermine that sense of familiarity, that sense that Western European history is our, by which I mean white history. Right. I've, I've so much of my career has been undermining that. But as a 20 year old at Wesleyan, I was not trying to undermine that. It felt familiar and yet so radically other, so radically different. And I like the work. Um, modern history, as you no doubt know, Varsha, right? There's yeah. an enormous amount of sources and, and the work involves finding rubrics and sifting those sources when you have, I mean, you know, for any one of, I know you work on dams, for any one of your yeah. dams, probably you could find thousands of local newspaper articles about that dam. So you have to come up yeah. with it. For my book, there are nine sources. And I oh. have to, and then maybe about a hundred fragmentary related sources. So I've read all of them. And I've had in all of them, I've read all of the extant sources of which I'm aware. And I have looked at, usually in person, but sometimes over, over in books or whatever, all of the relevant works of art. And I mean, I think I have at least looked at everything, everything relevant to my project. And I've had to build, uh, build out from that. And I just really like that work. I like that deductive work of having uh, fewer sources than we need and then trying to expand from that. I work on Venice. I work on 13th century Venice. There was a fire in the, in the inventory, the treasury of San Marco in the 1230s that burned up sources that I would love to have. Um, they're gone. Ouch. So I have to, and they've been gone, you know, obviously since well before I've done, started even thinking about this since the 1230s. So all of my work kind of exists in the concept of, I know those sources were there, they were burned in a fire, they would have answered questions that are important to answer. How am I going to answer those questions anyway? It's that kind of work that really got me excited about the Middle Ages, that kind of thinking through deductive work, taking sources that are not at all about the kinds of questions I want to answer and trying to use them to answer those questions anyway. Yeah, it seems like, um, you know, I think there, I think for any pre-modern historian, and probably maybe for any historian kind of generally, anybody who studies anything kind of in an archive, it's like, there's a fire that, that yeah. ruins <laughs> some sort of collection of sources or something. So, I mean, you know, whether it's, the, you know, the, co the cotton fire at the you know, right. library or, you know, the, the, the fire of St. Venice or, or like destruction during World War II in which abbeys yeah. and stuff were, were destroyed. Like there's always something. Um, but I do want to come back to something that you mentioned about like, um, you know, when, and, and I had a very similar experience too, is that my introduction to, to the Middle Ages, what kind of got me interested in the Middle Ages is not what I'm interested in kind of now, right? Yeah. Because we think of the Middle Ages kind of very traditionally as constrained to Europe, very white, you know, very consistent. And so, you know, I know like a lot of your work and, and, and you know, we're building upon the work of lots of other really important, you know, scholars, especially scholars of color who have who've trod this, this ground very well. But like, like, how is that, how is that, how has the study of the Middle Ages kind of changed in the last, like, you know, 10 to 15 years? I mean, I think the work that a lot of, a lot of other people have done around the global Middle Ages of, of talking about uh, that Europe was not some isolated, homogenous, white, Christian, Catholic, not just Christian, but Catholic space, uh, Western Europe throughout this thousand year period. Um, <laughs> You know, my, my professor, my undergraduate professor, who is a good friend of mine, back when we used to have conferences, I would see him at conferences, <laughs> you know, but he, he was an English medieval historian. He is, um, he is of West Indian descent, but adopted and raised in Canada, um, Ashkenazi, uh, Jewish, right? So there's a lot going on there, but I can't tell you that the history he taught me wasn't a very white Catholic history with occasional outsiders. So Muslims in Spain, Jews and isolated communities, um, and then periodic heretics. I mean, that was really the history I learned from him and the history that, that I taught initially as I started, really. Um, I don't think that history is sustainable now for people who want to think of themselves as medievalists. Anyone can specialize in any given place and any given time and talk about the people who happen to be in that place and time. But just this idea of an isolated backwards Middle Ages, uh, white, again, white Catholic Middle Ages, um, has really, 
I think is no longer the dominant narrative being taught, not just in advanced classes or grad classes or in you know scholarship, but at the basic kind of 101 level or people teaching classes that are often still called Western Civ are no longer teaching that, that narrative of, well, we start in Egypt, but then we move into France and then we never leave. Um, I just don't think that, I think that has really changed and changed for the better, changed for the better politically. Um, there are a lot of bad people who are invested in the, the isolated narrative that we need to undermine, but also changed for the, narr- the better in terms of what the history actually is, because that's just not, it just ain't so. It just ain't so. Yeah. I just want to say it's very actually, even though I study centuries later than you guys, it's very similar as to how U.S. history has changed. Specifically, U.S. foreign yeah. policy history used to be just about the decision makers. And even people who currently studied the decision makers acknowledge now than they didn't 20, 30 years ago that it's not just about the decision makers, but how these decision makers are interacting in a global sphere. The United right. States is no longer this isolated country that is just making decisions on behalf of itself, but is constantly reacting to and being influenced by countries other than Europe. Um, and so I study the period during the Cold War. So I think that that's like a major positive change that's happened. Um, and it's not just about medieval history or people who study, you know, the Renaissance, but I think it's, it's true people study the United States as well. Um, I just realized that the only technically medieval history class I took was ancient India to 1757. So I spent yeah. a lot of time on the Mughal, Mughals. So I know nothing about Europeans, but I know about the Mughal period. So. Yeah. And, and these, are, these are connected realms. And if they're not connected by individuals, going from one place to another, which happen more often than I think people think. Um, yeah. They're connected by stuff. They're connected yeah. by ideas. They're connected, yeah. they're, the flow of ideas. There's a wonderful, um, there's a wonderful article by uh, a historian named David Christian that I like to teach. It's, it's called The Step Road, S-T-E-P-P-E, uh-huh. right? So there's the Silk Road where, you know, people actually traveled, but there's this movement of stuff across the step, and it's a little slower from, from group to group over generations. But porcelain and silk and ideas and culture are still moving across these people from antiquity throughout throughout the whole period. And um, you know, I, I have a friend, Kathleen Kennedy, who at the medieval Dr. K. Uh, maybe she's on the call. I don't, maybe she's watching. I don't know. But a very good friend of mine from grad school who talks about ginger and parrots and coconuts in medieval England. Right? Medieval England is a long way away from places that are producing coconuts and parrots and ginger but they have them and it's not weird. Like, it's not like, wow, what is this? It's, oh, this is a coconut, right? This is a parrot. Um, it's, it's totally normal. Um, and I think that's a really powerful way to think about a connected pre-modern world. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's something that, that's, that's particularly interesting to me too, is that I think that the way that history is often taught, unfortunately, is that, so, or at least is presented maybe sometimes, is that it's, it's, it's a very simplistic narrative, right? Is that you can understand it it's just kind of names and dates very, very stereotypically. But the thing that, that at least attracted me and what I'm hearing both from, from you, Barsha, and also from you, David, even though I'm pointing at the screen, you can't see, <laughs> um, is that is, it, is actually the thing that's most interesting is the complexity, right? It's yeah. the questions that are raised. It's like, where did, like, like you were just saying about coconuts, like, like how, did, how did people in medieval England get, got, get coconuts? Like, they got yeah. them. Like, like people knew how to get them. So like, how do we figure that out, right? right. And the fact that, that there were these interconnected kind of places in which you could have silks and spices and things like that coming across vast land masses. I mean, um, you know, the Charlemagne's elephant, the elephant that Charlemagne supposedly received in the ninth century came from India. Like it wasn't, a, it wasn't an African elephant or anything like that, but it came from, you know, it traveled thousands upon thousands of miles and wound up in Northern Germany in the ninth century. Like, how does that happen? Yeah. And it wasn't, I mean, it was weird, but it wasn't like that weird. It wasn't the out of, out of the, poss- the realm of possibility, right? So, I mean, it, it almost seems like, David, and, and I don't want to step out of line here, is that the Middle Ages are crying out for a new one volume history that needs to be written by someone. So do you have any <laughs> ideas about who could, who could do that? Are you two writing a book? It turns out that Matt and I are writing a book. Um, obviously, the fix, the fix is in. So we're writing a book called <laughs> we're writing a book called The Bright Ages um, as a de- deliberate kind of slap against the dark ages um, because the Middle Ages were not particularly bright or not particularly dark. Um, they're just 
a thousand years, right? They, they're a thousand years with all the things that humans do. Um, and they have, again, specificity about them, but also uh, all the, I mean, all the complexity of humans. When I, when, I, when I was teaching, so I was a professor for 10 years, and then I decided to move uh, back to Minnesota. I'm an academic advisor in the big U of M history department. I advise every history major at the University of Minnesota, the main Twin Cities branch campus. And um, one of the things I like to say to grad students, Varsha, but also any grad students who are listening, yeah. it's okay to reorganize your life around things that you think will make you happy, um, yeah. as opposed to things that will bring you academic prestige. So I was, a, <laughs> I was a full professor, and now I'm a lowly salaried staff member, and I'm very happy. Um, and it's okay. Not all gambles about things that will make you happy work out, but it's okay to try to be happy. Um, so, so I, I, um, I lost my, I lost my train of thought. I have been drinking whiskey. Um, <laughs> so, so, so we have this, when I, when I was teaching though, I guess this is what, what I was saying is when, when I was teaching was this idea of trying to, to build these connections into my, into my teaching, um, and now trying to do it as a book. Um, there just isn't, when, when Matt and I started talking about this book, one of the things we discovered was that there was no even reasonably good single volume of, of, of medie medieval European history since the 60s by Norman Cantor. Norman Cantor was an interesting, if anti-Semitic and misogynist, 20th century historian. But he, I mean, he wrote interesting things. He was at least erudite. Um, but we've learned a lot since the 1960s. Then in the 90s, there was a guy named William Manchester who's better known for writing kind of biographies of Churchill, best-selling, huge, hugely successful, wealthy author. He wrote a book called The World Lit Only by Fire. Well, I mean, they did use a lot of fire. They also learned, you know, they burned oil, but like that's not the Middle Ages. Um, it was a way of getting to dark ages. I mean, it's just, um, it just ain't so. It just ain't so. So we, we've decided to embark on this work of synthesis uh, because we need it. We need to change the narrative about this thousand years, even just of European history, even though most of our history that we're writing, Matt and I are writing, is still located primarily in Western Europe, Western Europe, maybe Eastern Europe, certainly the Mediterranean. It's a connected history. So right now I'm working on a chapter on the Mongols. I'm, my next chapter after that will be on Maimonides and kind of medieval Judaism. Uh, I just wrote a chapter on the Vikings and, and thinking of Matt's elephant, or Charlemagne's elephant. Did you know that the Vikings probably wow. rode camels? They, they rode camels? They rode camels. The Vikings went to the Caspian Sea, they raided the Caspian Sea, and then according to medieval Arabic uh, chroniclers, they got on camels and they, the Vikings took camels to Baghdad to sell stuff and buy stuff. And I just feel like we have Hollywood and fiction and also history has betrayed us by not giving us Vikings on camels. Vikings <laughs> on camels. Vikings on camels. I mean, I just want to write, I want to say that phrase Vikings on camels as often as possible until I see it on the big screen. So building on that, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, Vikings are not properly represented by our uh, TV, what is the <laughs> worst movie or book about your research area that you've ever seen or read? And like, how do worst. we get away from this bad history of, of medieval history, right? Like, you've, we've talked about how the Dark Ages were not really dark. How do we get away from this image of um, the Dark Ages being dark? Well, well, for one, once we're done with it, everybody buys our book. That's the first step. <laughs> <That's the first laughs> step. Um, just, just to be clear, my, my, my editor would be mad at me if I didn't say that. Um, You're doing the Lord's work, David. You're doing the Lord's work. <laughs> what was it called? There was this incredible movie set. Was it Iron Heart or Iron? Sh I, I should look it up. There's this movie set in medieval England where, like, they're Iron defending. Clad. Iron Clad. They're defending. I they're def they're defending this. I mean, that or maybe the the Russell Crowe Robin Hood, in which he invents parliamentary democracy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one one of the two. But Iron Clad, like, they're defending this. If the Templars come and they're the good guys and they're defending this castle against King John, who's actually a pretty, pretty good king compared to his brother, Richard the Lionheart, who was a totally crap king in a lot of ways. Um, and then like 10th century Danes show up to fight for King John in order to the promise that they won't be forcibly converted to Catholicism. 
And I got to tell you, the Danes converted to Catholicism a lot earlier than a lot of other people. <laughs> um, so I think that's the, and the Templars are like the, the noble heroes. That might be yeah. the worst. I mean, I have a, I have a long list. Um, so that, that Wait, might be so, the worst, yeah. So Braveheart is not the worst medieval movie. <laughs> well... <laughs> I mean, I know, it has, I know it has no I am not going to defend Braveheart. Okay. The thing about Braveheart, I mean, like, it is at least representing a thing that happened, right? There, there was a, a rebellion. Um, they were not dressed up as pre-medieval picks, to my knowledge. They were not wearing 17th century kilts, to my knowledge. Like, so... I'm not an expert in medieval Scotland, but there's this, the famous scene sort of yeah. of the battle, right? They're wearing, they're wearing kilts that are really kind of a kind of paraphernalia developed as a tourist item in the, in the 18th century, 19th century. It's, it's all Walter Scott's fault. But they're also wearing woad, which is very much a pre-medieval uh, battle, battle garb. So there's a lot going on there. But at least there was a rebellion, right? Yeah. Uh, at least the Scots did rebel. Ironclad is an event that didn't happen involving people who mostly didn't exist, um, talking about things that mostly didn't happen. Um, and mostly is not the way medieval people thought about it. So that's, I think that is the worst medieval movie, but I'm sure we can find others. Okay. I, think it's, I, think it's, I think it's super interesting too, if I could just kind of build on that, is that, um, is that you know, you were talking about the, you were talking about kind of what interests us in, in the study of history is that, that complexity, right? And that, you know, what we're trying to do in the Bright Ages is to show a fully complex, kind of fully human Middle Ages is yeah. that, you know, it's not the Dark Ages in which everything was kind of terrible, but at the same time, like, we're not trying to recuperate the Middle Ages and make it kind of, like, perfect in any way, right? You know, one of the one of the things we, we kind of say when we're talking about our book is, like, the fires that illuminated st stained glass also lit the pyres of heretics that, you know, were, were, were murdered, you know, for, for religious, mm -hmm. um, religious persecution. But at the same time, you know, you know, I think the what you're saying about the the picks and the woes and like this movie idea gets to this really interesting point, which which we've certainly talked about. And others, many others, have talked about way before us, is that the Middle Ages become this kind of place that you press contemporary concerns, right? Is right. that Braveheart represents kind of Mel Gibson's kind of weird anti-English among his anti-Semitic <laughs> ideas, yeah, many terrible ideas, um, you know, in the same way, like like. One of the re one of the reasons I always one of the movies that sorry I always teach when I teach medieval history is Kingdom of Heaven, right? Which is ah. about the Crusades, which is much more representative of the period in which it was made, which was right around the Second Iraq War in two thousand three two thousand four, right? And which representing kind of this, this 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 eternal war in the Middle East, in which we just we just kind of thought about it a little bit more. We'd all kind of realize how silly it was. Um, so I mean, like you know, I know your work has kind of confronted that, David. Like, like how do you how do you kind of use that, like these bad medieval movies, to teach something, teach something interesting, to pull people into the real yeah. Middle Ages, into what's actually happening? You know, when that movie came out, I was teaching as a graduate student at Saint Olaf College, um, which was an interesting place to teach everyone in their first year. It's a Lutheran college; um, everyone has to take a Bible course, so they've all at Ooh. least. I mean, they're interesting classes like the Bible and Jews or the Bible and Muslims or the Bible and women, right? It's, they're, they're the liberal Lutherans or the ELCA, they're the good Lutherans. <laughs> I'm in Minnesota. There's the good Lutherans and the bad Lutherans. Sorry, Missouri <laughs> Synod. Um, I said what I said. But um, <laughs> I rented a van and I took them to the movie. It came out right, on, right during exam week of that year I was teaching. So I took them to the movie and I, had an, I told them ahead of time, I'm going to have an exam question. Tell me about the movie. And it was great. Um, I mean, I do think that the ways in which the Middle Ages becomes this blank slate for people to write their concerns on um, is interesting and worth teaching, but also concerning. Um, it's concerning, it's interesting when it's Ridley Scott trying to preach anti-religious multiculturalism in Kingdom of Heaven. It's interesting, there's an Egyptian movie called Saladin, I think from 67, 68, kind of in the the heyday of Egyptian cinema. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's a, a pro Nasser, pro pan Arab narrative. It's teaching, it's from the perspective of Saladin. It's a brilliantly interesting movie. It's all on YouTube. You can watch it. Um, I'm interested in Alexander Nevsky, which is again a Crusades movie, but it's about the, the, the Russians fighting against uh, the Germans in very much a World War II context, right? I mean, these things are interesting when it's not my problem. When it becomes about 21st century white nationalists picking up the Crusades as a reason to literally inscribe a gun with 
historical dates and then go murder Muslims in New Zealand, then it becomes a, a 2020 problem or a, a 21st century problem. And so I do yeah. think these things are, are incredibly serious, interesting, important, but incredibly serious when as reflected kind of in this modern internet age. And I've been working a lot on gaming. Um, I just wrote a piece for One Zero, which is a medium publication on Crusader Kings 3, which is trying to fix some of the problem with Crusader Kings 2, in which, <laughs> which if you're not a gamer, sorry, but Crusader <laughs> Kings 2 is this massive simulation game. And by the time all of the expansions were released, you could play anywhere from China to West Africa. But it was initially released really as a game in which the best way to play was either as Byzantium or as Western Europe and to wage as many holy wars as possible and to really get into holy war, to think holy war is fun. Holy war is what you do. Well, that's kind of a complicated message in the moment of yeah. rising, rising global Anglophone white supremacy uh, in yeah. which crusading iconography shows up again and again in these violent moments. Yeah, that's, that's so interesting to see how, you know, the Middle Ages can be used not just to learn positive things or yeah. interesting things about, about international and global connections and how they've always been with us, but it also can reinforce really negative images about, you know, Europe being isolated and better than everything. Um, so when is the Bright Ages coming out? <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> Thank you for asking it. Do we know? Um. <laughs> I think you're supposed to answer that, David. Like, <laughs> it's it's the the manuscript is due in October. Um, okay. Yeah. It has been a complicated period to write. What with this global yeah. pandemic. Um. I mean, I spent I spent a couple of months, which I thought would be writing, uh, caring for my children. I went half time uh, to particularly to try to help with my son who um, needs a little more support in terms of learning. Um, now I have childcare again, so we'll see how the summer goes. But it's due in October, and um, so okay. I think we're about a, I think we're probably sixteen, eighteen months away, um, if okay. not twenty, if not twenty-four months away. But we're Matt and I are working hard, um, and yep. and I do just feel every day that we need. So I want to say that there are an incredible group of scholars doing the work in scholarly communities, trying to reshape scholarly communities, publishing specialized scholarship. I'm a big, big believer in specialized scholarship. If you have something to write that is only for an audience of 10, but they're the right 10 people who really know the things and you wanna reshape them, I believe in that. I think it's really important. Um, but I also hope that this book will be sold in paperback in airports um, because Again, and, and it's, it's going to be hard, but <laughs> yeah. this idea of the Dark Ages has lasted for 600 years, um, and it just ain't so, and we need to present a different narrative. We need to present a different big narrative to try to, to, try to begin to reshape how people think about this period. Yeah, and I think if we can elevate you know, the voices of some of those people who are doing kind of laboring, you know, unheralded, un un unfortunately unheralded kind of doing this work, um, you know, and we, we can elevate those voices. I think that, that'll be enough. That'll be, that'll be a lot, you know, to accomplish there. So, but if our editor is watching, we are working on it. Don't We're worry. totally going to so, get that deadline. It's totally going to We're going to get that deadline, yes. So. <laughs> Um, so I'm just looking at the time. Unfortunately, we're, we're just about out of time. This thing to go so quickly. Unfortunately, there are it's even 41 better. Questions. There are 41 questions that we haven't even gotten to and that we've just had such a great conversation and um, I, small miracles. I haven't lost power this time like I did last time. So I was able to actually participate the, the entire time. So um, let me let me thank our guest, uh, David Perry. Um, uh, for, for, for a wonderful conversation. Um, and of course, um, on behalf of um, myself and, and my co-host, Marsha, um, thank you so much for, for all of you for joining us. Uh, next week, we're going to have uh, Dr. Eleanor Janega, uh, who is going to be talking about medieval sex apocalypse. Maybe not together, Something. but like... No, together. All that stuff kind of together. All Maybe of that together. together. I don't know. <laughs> like, tune in and find out. So, um, but please join us. Uh, join us. Uh, you know, you can see the full schedule at drinkinghistorians.com. And um, otherwise, thank you so much for tuning in. Enjoy your weekend. I hope you were able to join us for a drink. And see you soon. Cheers. Yeah. See you soon, guys. Bye. Bye.